So I'm here in Moab. We've just left the LaSalle Mountain foothills and it was called what? Warner Lake? Uh, Warner Lake. Warner. Warner, Warner yeah. Lake, Warner Campground. Can you so, pronounce Warner? Warner, I said it properly. <laughs> we, we pronounce it properly because we're from England. So I've got Thomas Heaton. Hello. And I've got Mike Taylor. And we've been doing the uh, Out of Moab Photography Conference for the last, uh, what, three, four days? Yeah, three, four, four, days. four, five days maybe. It'll be five. And uh, so this is your first time out here, Tom. What do you think? It's terrible. <laughs> Awful. Oh, shit, look at that. I know. Uh, oh, no, it's fantastic. The great thing about this is it hasn't stopped raining all week, which is great because it makes me feel at home. Um, <laughs> and yeah, uh, we can shoot desert, canyons, towers, turrets, arches, but then we can drive for 45 minutes and we're in the high mountains, Aspen, Snowfall, Autumn Colours, it's got everything. Yeah, and I didn't even know about that, so I'm glad you suggested it, because otherwise I would never have come out here. I know, the out-of-towner suggested it. So. Yeah, so you got a local a local tipped you off. I did, a local tipped me off, which is invaluable, which is why you should always chat to other photographers. Yeah, they tell you about those secret locations. Christoph for a dump or a, or taking pictures. Oh, he's taking pictures. He's taking pictures. He's, taking, he's, taking pictures. he's uh, trying to pull one over on us. I'll what? pull a fast one. So are we, are we committing then? We're not stopping? No, no, we can't stop or we just, we'll get nothing. All right, let's commit well, to it. Well, this is shite anyway. Come on, guys. Yeah. So, we've, we've this is before. adequate at best compared to what we've been shooting. So Tom, tell me, out of all your travels, what has been the most amazing location that you've ever shot? Oh, you can't ask me that. I know, I know. It's a brutal question, but... Uh, the most amazing location is a small valley about 15 minutes from my house. Because you can travel the world and you can see the iconic sites, but nothing beats creating a five-star image in your own back garden. And I think sometimes it requires you to live there so that oh, you've yeah, got yeah. that constant access. I have a photograph of a tree that nobody will have an image of. Yeah. And I didn't really say where it was taken, so hopefully still nobody has an image of it. Um, and it's one of my favorite images. Uh, yeah. it's, uh, it's called Star of the Show. We'll uh, put it on screen now. Yeah. And that's, that's one of my favorite images. Fantastic location, really close to home. And you know, it, it hasn't been replicated by anyone else. You know, we, we go to Mesa Arch or, or the other, one of the other arches. You know, you take a shot, it's nice, but let's be honest, kind of 10 a penny. Yeah. So shooting locally with that intimate knowledge uh, allows you to get images that just simply do not exist. Yeah. And that's why that's my favorite location. And so with that shot, is that was that like a you just kind of stumbled on the scene and it was like you got it immediately or was it like did you have to work it a little bit well i uh i saw the weather report it was gonna be cold really cold it's unusual for where i live so i went to a, a woodland i know really well but it's elevated about five six hundred feet and because there was a temperature inversion the higher you got the warmer it became so there's yeah. no frost up on the on the hills but down in the valleys it was always frost so I knew there was a valley a really big valley um, with huge open meadows and individual trees and and it was an area I'd wanted to visit but never really got around to um, but I knew where it was and I knew that that was gonna be cold so I went down to this valley walked around and took some lots of images of all this amazing hoarfrost that was covering everything and then just as the light was starting to get a bit too harsh um, I saw this one tree backlit by the sun, still had hoarfrost on it, but the background was still in shadow, so you had that separation. That contrast. Yeah, long lens to compress everything, get rid of all the crap that was surrounding it. Yeah. And the best thing is, as the light hit the tree, the frost immediately started to melt. So you had like a minute to get this shot, another minute, and then the light would have spilled onto the background, and yeah. the shot would have been good. Whereas if you'd taken a photograph too early, the tree would have been in shadow, the background would have been in shadow, it would have been very good. Yeah. So that image existed for a matter of minutes. Yeah, a little moment that in time. A moment in time, and that is why it's such a special image to me, and why that's such a special location. And I don't think we've had a frost like it since. So, yeah. Excellent. Mike, I'm gonna throw that same question to you. What is What has been your, like, Iconic, bang, I know I got that shot. It's your favorite shot. Where was it? Marshall Point Lighthouse uh, on the coast of Maine. Marshall Point Lighthouse in Maine? Yes. So tell me about that. What, what, what was so good about it? The way the tower cap is designed on the top of the lighthouse, it, it throws this, um, what I call the wagon wheel effect, where there are shadow rays that, oh, that oh, come I've out seen of this that. lighthouse, yeah. right? And if, if you can 
get to the right spot, if you have a nice clear night, you can get the wagon wheel effect shooting on the rocks right next to the lighthouse. Um, the lighthouse in the foreground with the Milky Way right behind it. You can get all that in one shot and it's I've, I've been there many, many, many times and it's just a matter of being there at the right time, uh, at the right moment, and being able to know exactly where to stand so that the, the light coming from the tower cap does not blow out the shot. Yeah. And it's it's uh, ethereal, let's put it that way. Yeah. So one of the things that they talked about today on that conference was like, how do you feel when you know you've captured an amazing image? And like for me, I'm like, I'm almost, I've almost got the shakes. If I've got, if I know I've got a killer shot and it's in the bag, it's on that memory card, I know I've nailed it. Like I, I'm quivering. I can't wait to get back and edit that. Yeah. Like, what's it like for you? I, yeah, man, I, nothing changes my mood like a good photograph. I can be having the worst day. Yeah. Miserable, cold, wet, dropped my camera, batteries run out. I'm, you know, I'm on like 1% battery, memory card's nearly full. I can't compose anything, nothing's working. I've got a headache, I'm tired and I feel sick. And then that moment of light, that inspiration, that composition, that satisfaction of creating yeah. an image and finding something, hit the shutter, nail it, hold your breath for a second while you zoom and check your focus, check your exposure, and then double check, make sure, yeah, it is good. And then it's just like, I will literally be singing as I'm yeah. walking back to the car. Yeah, just walking on air. Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we do it. I don't think we would do it if you didn't get that feeling. That high. Sometimes, you know, it's a lot of effort, isn't it? And if you didn't get that emotional attachment to your image, well, you eventually you would just, your camera would be put on a shelf and you wouldn't pick it up again. Yeah. So it's like anything. It gives you that surge of adrenaline or something, you know? Yeah. And that satisfaction and that, that feeling of being able to create something from effectively nothing. From nothing, you know, yeah. yeah. So for me, like photography, the reason why I'm hooked on it, why it's a passion, it's an obsession really, is you get like two shots of creativity. So you get one in the field when you're out shooting and you're capturing that that image and it's you're out in nature, you're seeing something that nobody else has seen, you've, you've had that perfect moment in time and you know you've captured it. So that's like the first shot, like that's the high. And then when you get back to the lab and you're at home and you, you download those images and you, and you put together that vision that you had, that's like the second shot of adrenaline yeah. that gets me like, yeah! What what else do you have out there that, like, that gives you that double shot? You could make it a treble shot and print it. Oh, yeah! Good yeah. point, yeah. You know, finish it off, put it in a frame. Yeah. And, uh, print it large! Yeah. Yeah. Because that's the, I guess that's the ultimate goal of the photographer, to see that, that image on a wall, yeah. on a, a, a physical piece of art that's lit properly, it's beautifully framed or mounted, that's the finished product, yeah, it's, right? it's a full journey. It's, it's inspira an idea, inspiration, creativity, creation of the image, and then you finish it off with a physical print. Yeah. So much better than just looking at it on your phone and forgetting about it. That's the thing. It's like, how many times do you see an awesome iPhone shot and they're like, people are really proud of it. And it, it does, you know, they might have made a great composition and it's a good shot, but then they come to print that, any, anything larger than a sort of eight by 10, and it just looks shat punk. This is, do we have time? Do we want to no. stop? And, no, no I, we don't. I don't because do. I, looking at this, I think Archers is probably killing it right now. I know. Yeah, this light like, is just heavy. Stick to the plan. Let's stick, stick to the plan. To the, plan. That's the first rule of photography, stick to the plan. So what do you do when you go out shooting, right? You've got a concept in mind. You've got a location that you already know. You're familiar with it. Do you kind of like, let's just say you're not shooting one of your videos. You're just shooting for you, right? Do you say, right, I'm gonna to stick to this comp that I'm in love with, that I'm attached to, and just wait for that perfect light? Or do you really work the scene and move around and wait for things to reveal themselves? Uh, both, so um, it depends. I mean, if I'm in a new location like uh, we were today, I move around, look for everything, anything that inspires me, spend a lot of time scouting, just, just being in the environment and looking for anything that catches my eye. But yeah, if, if I have a shot in mind, I will go and it's all about assessing the conditions. If it looks like there is a reasonable chance that the light's going to happen and I'm going to get what I want, I will just wait it out no matter what's going on behind me and then around me. But then sometimes you think, okay, this clearly isn't going to happen, the clouds are blocking the light, so 
and see if we can find something else. So it's all about reading the environment and reacting yeah. accordingly. Yeah, because if you get the the shot set up and the light just does not cooperate, but things are kicking off behind you, you you've got to reevaluate. Yeah, you got to react. Yeah, but then you've got to be careful not to react, and then the light kicks off behind you, and you get a mediocre <laughs> shot with a great sky. <laughs> And then you turn around and you go, oh no, it's, yeah, you, know, you have to be patient. Sod's law. But I guess for you, Mike, like you've really got to plan and have a concept for your night photography images. It's different, right? You've got to really think about what am I going to do? What lights am I going to bring? Where yeah. am I going to put things? How do you, you don't, I don't think Astro's reactive, is it? Unless you get maybe a, a meteor or a shoot of stars or something. Um, I, I would say that, yeah. Absolutely, there's a lot of planning going on, but at the same time, um, whereas Thomas has spoken very eloquently about how he would approach a scene, I would say, f***ing walk around and look at everything. <laughs> so oh, that's, that? that's, that's, a, uh, that's a demonetized <laughs> yellow tick if I've ever seen one. Oh <laughs> Hashtag demonetized. You, you, you said we have to f***ing make people laugh. Yeah, you gotta right? be yourself, mate. You gotta be yourself. Uh, because that's what beeps are for. I still have not heard Thomas yeah. cuss once. I don't. Not a f He never word. swears. Not a one. No. I flipping don't swear. Classy English man does not swear. I myself never drop f bombs. F no. No. Okay. Ooh. Ah, look. chipmunk. Little Woo. cutie. They're so I cute. I only swore then. <laughs> cool. So, what's next for your travel plans? What is the place that you're looking forward to the most? Ooh. Well, I'm going to Iceland again, which I always look forward to. Yeah. But I'm looking forward to the stuff that hasn't been planned yet. You know, just having a break, getting all the commitments out of the way, the workshops, the conferences, everything. Uh, mid to late November, it'll die down. I'll have three months of no commitments. It's that. That's the time when I have a hot bath and a whiskey <laughs> and start getting my books out and start looking for inspiration because it only takes me a few weeks before I start getting the bug again. You know, yeah. I'll work in my local area, I'll travel to Scotland, stay in the van, do the UK a bit, and then I'll start thinking, right, what else is out there? I've got a couple of months, maybe I could find a week and go somewhere new, and then I'll start getting the books out and reading. Yeah. So uh, I'm excited for actually having no plans, if that makes yeah. sense, because of what's to come. Do you find that as a traveller, going overseas a lot, that, you know, you're used to a certain pace, right? You've got like, uh, workshop, conference, your own shooting things, it's bang, 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 constant, you're on the go. And then when you do have that break where you've got like two or three months at home in one spot, how long does it take before you start getting antsy? Like, ah, I need to get back on the road. Um, yeah, like two, a couple of months usually. Yeah. It's weird because when I'm traveling, all I want to do is go home. Yeah. And when I'm at home, all I want to do is go traveling. Whoa, blinding. Blinded yeah. by the light. No one else knows what those lyrics yeah, are. Back up like a douche, another room in the night. Like, what is it? Like, what yeah, is no, it saying? I'm sure, it says, to me, it says, back up like a douche. Back up. But that makes no right. sense. I don't know okay, what he the, actually the said. The lyrics are wrapped up like a deuce in the middle of the night, but all you English mother think he says douche. What's a deuce? A, do a deuce, number two. You know what a deuce is? It's a, num it's a shit, isn't it? It's a number two. A deuce. A deuce. <laughs> I've, already, I've already forgotten it. Cut right there, that's fantastic. Hey, what? Go on, do it for Blinded by the light. No! <laughs> 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 what? In the middle of the night. In the middle of the yeah, night. What's a Wrapped deuce? Up like a oh, shit. Have I missed it? No, no, straight, straight, straight. You're good. Yeah, yeah let's listen to Thomas. <laughs> what? I still want to know what a deuce is. Yeah, what's a, what's a deuce? Is, is it a card? From a, like a deck of cards? It's Correct. Like right. What? Is correct. So is the reference for like a poker game? Yes. How is it reference? As far as you know. So Mike, where's your next hot location in the States or Canada? Hot location we'll be going to um, in two days we'll be going over to New Mexico to shoot uh, Shiprock and yeah. the Bistai Badlands. Oh Bistai where, Badlands. Where the <sighs> alien throne is located oh, and the King of Wings God. and the cracked eggs and all that kind of stuff. Have really? you seen that place? The business. No. It's, oh, it's, I may have seen images. Does yeah, that you probably have, I've, yeah. I've been to a couple of deserts in my life, but the uh, High Plains Desert of New Mexico is the most desolate area I've ever seen. Yeah. There are no power poles, right? There's no electricity for like 50 miles. The only people who live out there live in trailers and they have outhouses. They have no power. They have no running water. <laughs> they have nothing. It's really desolate. Let's put it this way. If you break an ankle out there, you are 
Yeah. Because there is no, no self-service. No There's service. nothing. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in the spring, um, we're really excited because we've hired a uh, Navajo guide to take us out into Monument Valley. So this will be the first time we're doing Monument Valley at night. Yeah. Um, and when we, when we announce the workshop uh, to our alumni clients, it's sold out in less than 24 hours. And we have like five people on the wait list. So pe people have been looking for, uh, for, uh, for a, a, a cool trip to go out to uh, Monument Valley at night. So I'm stoked about that. I'm looking forward to seeing those pictures. Oh, I am too. It's a road, it's a joke. So Tom, uh, what has been the most challenging location that you've ever shot? Uh, Zion. Z really, Zion? So challenging. Why? Just, just nothing works. You find a tree and you go, yes, and then you move and you go, oh no, there's a tree behind it, let me just, oh no, there's another one behind it, I'll just, ah, oh, and it doesn't work. It's just, you know, you have to work so hard for your images. And you would think Zion would be easy, right? But, yeah. Like, okay, forget. The Iconic bridge shot. Yeah. Uh, looking down, you don't want that. Forget uh, the the Virgin Towers. For, you know, you don't really want that. So there's a couple of the icons aside. Going in there and trying to make it your own is really hard. Yeah. Um, and you have to work for it. You know, I've, I've never walked so many miles as I do when I'm in Zion and come out with one or two images that might be okay if I'm lucky. So, but it's really frustrating because to the eye, it's mind blowing. Yeah. To the camera, it's like ah, too much, too much chaos. I think I experienced the same thing. I didn't get a single good shot in there. Yeah, it's frustrating. But the most, to me, the most uh, challenging location I ever shot was Antelope Canyon, because I've never been. Oh man, it's. I mean, it's spectacular. It's like a, it's a wonder of the world, but it's so rinsed like there's so many people going through that canyon on a daily basis i think they've actually banned tripods oh now. is that the the shaft of light yeah oh yeah, really, uh, yeah. yeah. Don't you need a photographer's permit to go yeah. on there, um permit. maybe they, maybe yeah. you need that now but back when i did it you didn't i think you needed you need more permits if you're going to sell that stuff right yeah. if you need a commercial license but Correct. um and that, that's why, for me, it was so challenging because everywhere you go, you're bumping elbows, you're bumping tripods, someone's foot just uh, walked into your shop. Sounds like my idea of hell. So. It is. It's a logistical yeah. nightmare. But when you see the pictures, this it looks like such a tranquil, peaceful place. Like but, Mesa Arch. Yeah. yeah. So tell us about your first Mesa Arch <sighs> experience. Yeah, yeah the, the huge, grand Mesa Arch. I don't want to talk down on it too much because we were there with a the group but my I was thinking right so Mesa Arch in the picture it looks huge I thought it'd be 300 feet across <laughs> right so uh, we rocked up and there was like four or five photographers and I was like oh sweet there's only four people here we're gonna have tons of space turns out Mesa Arch is about 20 feet across and literally from where your tripod is you can lean forward and pretty much touch the arch yeah. yep so five photographers is reasonably comfortable for everybody getting a shot, right? As soon as you add to those five photographers, people start getting to the edge of the arch and it's not that great. But, you know, when I was there, there was 50 photographers. 50? 50. 50, I've got, I've got, here, put this picture on screen. 50 photographers and- All with tripods. Tripods, iPhones, like, like gather, imagine, I don't know, imagine Brad Pitt just rocks up in the, you know, unannounced in the city centre, <laughs> everyone's gonna, that's what it was like, and I couldn't believe it. And the, the thing is, as well, there was no light, they were never gonna get the glow, and nobody anticipated this, nobody could read the weather, they always got their spot and sticking to it. Um, and then, is that our group? No. <laughs> uh, and, uh, where, meanwhile, me and a few other group members, we're forgetting the arch, let's go around the side and this yeah. side, we've got some beautiful shots. Yeah. Nice, light, fantastic landscapes that you wouldn't even necessarily know were taken at Mesa Arch. Yeah. Whereas everybody else didn't get anything because the light never came. They should have seen this and reacted accordingly. And I think that's the thing. It's like when you when you show up at an icon, a famous icon, and you don't get that classic cliched shot. You're always disappointed. Yeah, but well, if you've got the no. ability to adapt, then you're going to get something. You just have to change your thinking and try not to get locked into yeah, no, it. I must get this shot. Get rid of that competition and get out of your head. Like people were shooting this thing with no reflected light. So they're going to get the image, but they're going to see all this, all these other versions of the same image, but with gorgeous reflected light. So yeah. why bother? Exactly. Unless you're really into kind of blue tones and shadow and you're really making your own, which are yeah. fantastic, yes. But uh, I don't think that's what people were doing. 
Uh, but it's just funny because we walked off, you know, 500 yards one way or the other, and I was blown away by the, the landscape. It was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. So your first impression of Canyonlands, though, overall was? Uh, hang on, Canyonlands. Yeah. Arches. Canyonland? Yeah, oh. Mesa's out Mesa's in Canyonlands. Canyon. Oh, right. So I've been to Canyonlands, yeah, twice. Uh, we did Green River Overlook. Which oh, that's my favourite. Fantastic. Yeah. No crowds, nobody there. Beautiful landscape, great light, perfect. Uh, Mesa Arch, uh, it's not somewhere I would have shot personally, um, but happy to take the group there and work the area, which we did. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's a good, good exercise to go to an icon and not shoot the icon. Yeah. So it's a challenge. So guys, did you not find, like what I found teaching on this conference was the standard of the student's photography for like when we were doing critiques and when we were doing um, when we were doing sessions, one-on-one -on -one sessions. Better than ours. They were better than ours. <laughs> yeah. They were better than us. They were unbelievable. Yeah. They were better than yours. You, <laughs> you cheeky yeah. bugger. Yeah, but they were they were on a different level from what I've ever seen before. Yeah, they were very on, impressive. Yeah, was, very very impressed with with all the images. Do, that do I you want to hear a genuine criticism that I gave one of the participants when I was doing a critique? A genuine criticism. I said, it's it's too perfect. It was too good. I was like, ah, oh, because it was, and I was like, I can't critique this. It's, Who was that? Oh, is this Portuguese guy? I forget his name. Oh, really nice I guy. met him today. Uh, Got beard. Head Hendel or something oh, yeah, like yeah, yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. His name. Yeah. Hand Hendra or something? Yeah, watching this. Hender. I had lunch with him, right? Yeah. And we were chatting for like 20 minutes. I said, come on then, let's see these pictures. And I was like, I quit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's good. Hender, I, th I think his name's Hender. Helder. His name was Hedler. Helder. 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 It was it Helder or Hedler? I think it was Helder. Yeah, yeah. he was... Uh, he, was <laughs> he was rather impressive, that kid. Jesus. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, I need a piece so bad. So yeah, we should all uh, go on an excursion to the uh, Del Monte Mountains. <laughs> <laughs> so what's it like in the Del Montes? Yeah, yeah, the Del Montes. I want to go there. I've been meaning to go there for so long. One of the questions that one guy asked, and I get this, asked this question a lot, is how do you find and discover new locations? Uh, you have to walk. Well, that's it. You Hard can't work. Yeah, it is. You can, you know, you... You look on Google Earth and you look on Google, that all that does is give you an idea as to whether or not the area has potential. And the truth is, you will not know unless, you know, driving's okay, but driving you miss a lot. Yeah. And a lot of the good stuff there by trails anyway, so you have to walk. So yeah, uh, mountain biking is a good way, cover ground fast, but honestly, putting on your boot, picking out an area that looks like it has potential, putting on your boots and just spend time in. It's hard, you know? Oh, cows. Yeah, cows. I've got a road. tip for you. Yeah. How I discover a lot of my, my new locations, especially where I live on Vancouver Island is, I follow um, people that aren't photographers, so people that are climbers, oh, or yeah. adventurers, yeah, like, yeah, so they, yeah. they don't really care about if their pictures are any good, they're just kind of documenting that, that adventure. And so you don't expect, you know, a proper processing or anything like that, but it's enough to see, oh wow, I bet if I got there with a tripod and, and a bracketed... Climbers always go to awesome rock faces and huge cliffs. Exactly. So, yeah. They get viewpoints that you just can't get to from driving up to. You know, so I, I follow a lot of uh, climbers, That's cavers. Good, good tip. Yeah. Cavers. And, and you know what, the best place to find a lot of them is on Flickr. Because yeah. Flickr is like the oldest photography social media platform. And, and people have been on there for like 10, 15 yeah, years. Yeah, you know what Flickr is like? So this is, I love this comparison. Flickr is kind of like real life. Yeah. Whereas if you look on 500 pics, it's like, it's like porn. It's like yeah. pornography. <laughs> So if you watch, if you watch porn, like the women aren't real, the pictures aren't real, the places aren't real. It's all it's all too much and too too perfect and, yeah. and too like ah. But if you go on Flickr, it's like real life. You get to see amazing locations, but more snapshots, which yeah. gives you a much more realistic idea. Because if you go to a location, you've seen on 500 pics, well, the chances are you're going to turn up and you're going to go, uh, yeah. <laughs> what's this? And, you know, what's your philosophy? And I want to ask you this question as well, Mike. What's your philosophy on composites and fakes? I'll tell. I'll, I'll start with telling you how I feel about it. It is. I think it's all good. It's all fine. Like if you want to make a composite, that's cool. But 
disclose that you made a composite and tell me how you did it, maybe give me some tips. Don't pretend that that's a real situation, that that's a real scenario, because if your followers book a flight, book hotels, book cars, thinking that they're gonna see that, they're gonna, they're not gonna like you very much. Yeah. I'd say, oh, do whatever you want, you know, it's art, whatever. Yeah. Um, and yeah, composites in terms of if like you, Take one image and ten minutes later the light changes, take the second image, you go, oh, I like the light on the mountains, it wasn't in the first one, blend, that's that's kind of fine, it's still a, a moment in time. Uh, it's when the landscape is dramatically altered, something's added uh, to it or, or heavily taken away, then you should declare that. Yeah. Like, there's a well-known photographer whose name I will not name, who has a very famous image in Iceland, really nice image. And me and my Icelandic friend Thor, we, we look at this image and we're like, where is this? Let's go and find it. So Thor went to find it and he found it. He found the location. But he found half of the location because the right hand half of the image was there and he was stood at a clear point in the image, you know, a recognizable point. But the left, well, there was a valley in the picture, but there was no valley in real life. So this valley has been manipulated and pulled in and this creates this whole scene which it simply does not exist. Doesn't exist. Yeah. How do you feel about it, Mike? Um, I don't know what composites are, but composites, I don't have a problem. <laughs> Why would you pronounce composite. it incorrectly? <laughs> How do you say aluminium? Because I'm f American. This is America. We speak American. Americish. <laughs> Americish. So. Yeah, so how do you feel about, about I, fakes and I, I don't, I, you know this about me because uh, the one time that you put out the, uh, the, uh, it was like a sea stack uh, ocean shot on the, on the coast of Oregon, I think, and you yeah. had a fantastic Milky Way behind it, and you said in your description, this is absolute rubbish, this didn't happen, but, you know, you can do this if you're creative. I think that was the first time I contacted you and I said, cheers to you, man, because yeah. I completely agree, you do whatever you want. But certainly let people know if you're creating sh out of nothing. Yeah, exactly. Is there, is there anything you want to plug? That's right, you can yeah. buy my 2019 landscape photography calendar that have all my images from my last 18 months on YouTube. There you go. There you go.